I, I would love to ask you to share some stories uh, of failure. Like it's not very usual first question in panel discussion, but uh, recently I like I, like I start from uh, for me like I failed to estimate really important task and it uh, didn't hit really important milestone and I feel really bad about it. But then I realized that it's not the first failure on my work and like all the previous failure made me feel okay. So if you share something from your experience, maybe it will help for audience in their work life. Who would want to start? <laughs> yeah, I, I see them all want to start. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was that, thinking that, about that, this last like, Hello, my name is Sergey, and I failed the project. Like, <laughs> like anonymous club of the unsuccessful engineers. <laughs> Well, Welcome. Know, failure, <laughs> failure, if you take the time to like reflect on failure, it, it leads to success, right? I, so I was thinking about this last night about like the highlights of my career in terms of failure. And I think that the three like types of failures, like the, the themes of failures in my career were the first was like failing to identify accidental versus essential complexity. I think more so like earlier in my career, like in a little kind of goes along with what you're saying, Sergey, earlier about like trying to write perfect code or trying to, you know, come up with the perfect design up front or trying to solve problems that don't exist yet, trying to come up with designs that will deal with future problems, uh, but incur some upfront complexity now. Uh, and sometimes those future values never realized. And so the, the upfront complexity that you introduced into a design uh, may never yield the benefit and therefore you have to live with that complexity. So uh, that's the first sort of like, and I can drill into these, but the second one I think um, is a sort of a idea of failure is fashion. So following uh, what I call trends in the industry. Uh, so like every year there's something, some new hype and trying to chase that hype uh, and trying to learn the new framework or tool and stay up to date with that, I found to be uh, expired knowledge. I I remember times in my career where, um, so earlier in my career, I was doing some .NET development. And back in the day, when you did web development, it was ASP.NET, right? That was the web framework. And then out came this you know, community called Alt.NET and uh, somebody had written this thing called ASP.NET MVC, which was sort of looked like Rails and there were preview bits out. And I remember like mastering this framework and being so good at it. And years later, a lot of that knowledge, the framework knowledge that you know, those tiny bits of information, those nuances about the framework, they, they didn't last. The knowledge that lasted were sort of the, the, the pieces around model view controller, design patterns, or understanding HTTP in the web. So chasing fashion um, is something that I think that I failed at and I continue to fail at because it's so interesting when you see what's happening on Hacker News. And the third one I call communication trust or OSS panic. Um, I think like working, this is the most recent uh, thing. And please cut me off of taking too much of the airtime. But I learned from joining GitLab that um, all of a sudden, you know, I was working on open source projects on my own for the most part that I, I manage and receive contributions from, then going to an organization where everything is open source, all communication from issues uh, to getting things merged. I, I recognize this thing, which I'm dubbing OSS panic. So anytime that I wanted to get a small change merged, it turned into a fantastically long discussion. Like it could take days to ship a single line of code or even just get it merged. And I was trying to understand why is this? Is it because people are afraid to approve of the small change? Like really single quotes versus double quotes? Is it enough to warrant a 24 hour delay for that feedback before I can really you know, realize the feedback of actually getting it to the next stage in the pipeline? which to me is like very valuable feedback and aligns with iteration. So uh, communication <laughs> and OSS panic, those are the three things. So accidental essential complexity, fashion, communication, and trust. Yeah, cool. So like I actually uh, forget to mention that me and Mo, we actually work in the same team. So it was me who actually made this review for change double quotes to single quotes. Oh, you're not so. the only one that's not you. <laughs> like, I'm not picking on you as an example. It's just, 
Uh, yeah. Sorry. But. Yeah. Sure. So, like, Anna, would you like to share your story? Oh yeah, for sure. Basically, speaking of uh, failures, I would like to try to categorize it at first, but I think my categories will be different from more. Um, I can think about it as of uh, failures in terms of uh, money, when uh, my decisions, uh, intentional or un unintentional, leads to a loss of money, basically f spending for hardware to the company. Uh, second one, uh, I think it's uh, lack of experience. Uh, everyone has uh, has an area of expertise that he is not uh, good at, and uh, loss of data. It can can carry with the loss of money, but still, I think it's uh, something different. So, uh, speaking of loss of money, I was I fell into a trap. Well, I was experimenting with one of our projects uh, with uh, AWS and auto scaling. Uh, yeah, everyone can imagine what consequences can be after it. Uh, speaking of loss of data, it was really, really beginning of my career when uh, instead of a web development team, which I have right now, I was on my own uh, in Arctic 3D. And once, uh, due to lack of experience in DevOps, uh, I accidentally deleted the configuration file for SSH to the server, like production one. Uh, so I, I, I got in the end to the server without uh, an ability to access it, but still seems working. Uh, it led us to loss of data for, I think, a day and a half. And it, it was not that disaster, which it could be, but still it was quite, quite imperfect. And uh, what else? Loss of data, loss of money. And yeah, well, let's leave it like this. <laughs> okay, thank you for the answer. So, Sergey? Yeah, I think you know you can t you can talk about failures, uh, infinite am amount of time. I, I think like starting short, git push uh, dash f. That's the that's the way how do you get like the the majority of failures, specifically onboarding new new team members and not letting them know that not only they working with this uh, with this particular branch or this particular project. <clears throat> That's, uh, I've been in these shoes like many times for myself. And um, the solution is strictly, you know, have the uh, permission not to uh, contribute to the strategic branches with force, like easy fix to the config, but nobody cares, uh, including myself. Uh, that's, that's, I think, you know, the, the most simple failure to explain. Another one is to be um, married to idea. Uh, and uh, being an engineer, uh, wanted to like, we all wanted to create uh, something from scratch, like, hey, we need a new tool to do retrospective meetings. Why don't we create one? But there is a Trello board. No, Trello is not that super. Let's create something like Trello, but something with, you know, more cool features. And I have at the moment, uh, almost four Trello-like tools that we never completed and never shipped like to even like half-baked half uh, stage. So instead of creating something from scratch is better, like I, again, a lot of time wasted because you think you can implement that by yourself more faster than, than it, it really takes, like last year, for example. And uh, and this comes to the idea of failure that maybe you know you you married to the idea of Ruby as well. So I was in Ruby community ten years, and when you think like, hey, maybe you need to change your job, like changing the way you think, you stick with Ruby. And maybe uh, after some time, when anybody asks for me what was your biggest failure, I would say Ruby, and I will switch to virtual reality or to 
any kind of a new fashion brand technologies that everybody are happy to talk on the conference. And we like old fashioned guys. So it's hard to say that Ruby is, was, was my failure so far. Um, but who knows? So git push minus F, that was the biggest one. <laughs> Yeah, like I just, I guess, like so many people here, like uh, hearing your answers, like can relate because we were like everyone <laughs> was there. So, uh, Alexander wants to add something to the discussion and want to share his story of failure. So, your floor. Okay. Uh, hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, uh, very nice to see you all here. Uh, thank you for a nice, uh, interesting uh, speech, all of the speakers. So cool. Uh, and uh, I want to say about, uh, about the topic of the discussion, uh, about failures, uh, about my fails or fuck ups um, for some recent time about one year ago. It was uh, one project um, that I, um, uh, where I was, uh, th the first problem of this project was that I, uh, I was uh, one, uh, one uh, developer on this project. And um, it was a hard project for my uh, skill level. I think it's most of the problem of this pro about this project. The second part is uh, connected that um, it was um, almost uh, no team supporting me. So it was uh, one uh, previous developer that uh, supports the project and uh, one uh, guy that architects of that project. Uh, the next problem connected with that project is that it has some messy architecture. Um, um, and uh, the code's uh, legacy, it's okay about legacy, but uh, uh, um, analyzing the code of the project, I uh, became uh, to decision that it was very, very fast development and uh, nobody care about the quality of the project. Um, it's uh, have uh, zero tests. It's, it's not a problem. Uh, it's okay. But if you are uh, a new developer and you onboard into the project, uh, you have to analyze uh, all the code base uh, of the project and uh, the first task for you is uh, short, uh, take a short time to a deep dive into the project code base, understand uh, its architecture, understand how it's work and uh, begin to work on the project uh, for supporting, uh, for some bug fixing or adding new future features uh, and etc. cetera. And uh, my problems with this project was about um, uh, to understand how it works. It's very complicated. Uh, Ruby classes, Ruby files got uh, thousands of lines of code. Uh, even, for example, one method uh, can, uh, could be uh, uh, one or two hundreds of codes. Uh, so you read the code line by line, uh, check variables, uh, scrolls the screen and not understanding what happened next, where this variable came from, what's, what it does and etc. So uh, the guys, uh, previous developers, uh, 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 gracefully help, help, it, help me uh, to understand um, and some uh, cool tips. Uh, also that I got experience about this project that uh, I, I get uh, experience of pair programming session. I got a pair programming session with architecture uh, of the project uh, and it uh, longs about three hours. It was awesome experience uh, because we both uh, work uh, on one task on one um, and we help uh, each other. Uh, we have a Zoom session 
uh, where we can uh, uh, share, not only share screen, but share the keyboard and mouse. Uh, so the uh, architecture guy uh, just clicking on my keyboard and help me. So, and it, it's nice experience um, that I got from this project, but Finally, it, uh, it became that I can't to manage the tasks on this project and it was finished for me. So it's, yeah. that's got it. Yeah, thanks for sharing the story. So it looks like kind of uh, this, what was more talked about that like when you have some failure, it could be actually something good for you. So yeah. thanks for sharing. And uh, let's move forward to next question. Um, so like uh, as Alexander already mentioned, let's, uh, let's just like skip, like we have a list of questions here, but let's just keep for, uh, for one, which is really interesting for me. Uh, and uh, um, let's discuss why actually developers don't write tests and how we can make them do it. Sergey, maybe you can start discussion. That's, that's the question that continues uh the previous uh the previous topic like the previous question uh as you said there are some failures that teach you something that like when when you're on interview and you ask hey what is your like the biggest failure like oh you know i miserably failed to maintain a uh, hundred times of you know releases over the brilliant uh what what no 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 like you you can every time when you say your failures you can emphasize your good size saying like those was failures but i'm uh, so good at you know doing or keeping with uh, hard situations so i overcame it and now i'm like a superhero who managed to deal with with all the failures and i'm interested what if is there any failures that don't teach you like writing tests i think good example so if you don't write tests uh and you you like when you just started your career and everybody say you like test first TDD or whatever, you know, good approaches for, uh, uh, for doing your job right. And you don't write tests and um, it bites you on the back after some time when you need to be uh, on rush and quickly fix something and everything ruined. And you never learn from it and you continue doing like not writing tests then I think this is the situation. That's the, hmm, that's a good point to say what, what was your biggest fail, right? Not writing tests constantly. And I think that people consider writing tests as an extra. So uh, when there is a task, uh, you can say like, hey, nobody pays me for, for writing tests. I just write implementation and hands off and you deal with that. So when you ask me for estimation and it take one day without tests, it take like a couple of days with tests and your manager or customers ask you to do it as, as fast as possible and you skipping part of the test, that's the, uh, that's the problem, like that's the mental problem of accepting your work because in my world, you should say, you have to pay me extra if I write the code without tests. Because if I'm gonna maintain this code, it's gonna be harder for me to deal in the future if I just do hacks in the very beginning. So from my point of view, writing tests, tests is separated from the process for people who usually being under pressure of time, like running faster, just doing some hacker stuff to the project, but uh, I still, think that it's the personal responsibility not to do that. So nobody, uh, nobody should, you know, give you permission or bless you. Now everybody's in the team. We have like the, the next sprint, we can name the sprint of writing test first. Now like, that's, that's the way how you do it. Like no, nobody should, you know, bless you to write test. You just, at some point of your maturity in engineering, you need to consider that before you do anything, you write your test. As I'm holding the mic, super duper project, which I am inv invented last week. Uh, it's, um, it's, if you know how the artificial intelligence happened, right? So 
for example, machine, the first machine who played chess, and they said that it was machine, uh, there was a human inside. A human pretended to be machine and played chess and so on and so forth. So what if we announce that this is the first machine that writes Ruby code? And we uh, pretend that there is like people sitting on the backside of this machine. So you need to give a Ruby task and this machine like artificially create you the, the answer. And I was thinking how to make it work, how to like de-virtualize it. And the only way I consider it requirements to this machine you need to give as a test. So if you want the machine create you write code, you cannot explain it verbally. You need to explain it in the way how it's later is gonna be structured on the language that you work. So if you want to talk to artificial intelligence or to the machine, or if you want, want to talk efficiently or engage with your team members, do it with tests. So sorry for taking the mic. Hope to answer the question. Yeah. No, yeah, sure, it's answer the question. So Anna, could you continue maybe? Oh yeah, sure. It sounds like a really good plan how to add artificial intelligence to Ruby community. Uh, I would like considering this subject staying on a safe side and share my recent experience. Uh, I'm responsible not only for Ruby teams, I have different languages within my team. And what, what, what I can say, what I can tell about my uh, my feeling, I feel that uh, Ruby developers tend to write tests. So it's from my, from my experience, uh, people who come to our company to take an interview, uh, people who we hire in the end. Uh, and well, I have an impression that Ruby community itself uh, is like this. People write tests. And uh, from, from my expectations, it's, uh, well, I wish in different languages uh, there will be so mature culture of writing tests as it is in Ruby. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's really mm -hmm. great to, to hear. So, mm -hmm. well, can you add something to it? I'm surprised to hear that there's so many people out there that don't write tests today. Um, it's kind of... Um, eye awakening, I guess. I, I have been practicing TDD uh, for since 2007 when I read the nunit.org uh, website and the TDD by example and several others. And so I look at it as like part of my workflow. If I were to write code without tests, I don't know that I could write code um, because uh, I'm not a very good programmer. I need the tests as like a harness to uh, ensure that what I'm thinking or designing or about to work on uh, can be focused and actually does what I think it does. I remember uh, you know, when I was in environments where testing culture wasn't as normal and the things that some people would say would be like, it's too hard to write these sorts of tests. It's too hard to test this and keep it up to date. And most of that I think stemmed from culture rather than actual like technical constraint. Uh, when I heard that, what I heard is like, it's too hard to train people to run the tests <laughs> is, is actually what was happening. So I think um, for me, uh, it, it, it was a safety net, but it was also fun. Uh, I was able to be in positions where I would pair program uh, in certain environments. And one of my favorite forms of pair programming was ping pong uh, programming where one person would write the test and the other person would have to make it pass and then you'd rotate. And so it was sort of like a competition trying to, uh, trying to write a test that was hard to get working or vice versa. Um, and in some ways, you know, you would cheat the test by just hard coding a number or something. And so you would push the other person to write the test. Now, after a while you realize like you don't need to test every single scenario and you understand sort of like the the trade-offs and how to be a responsible programmer and when is enough testing and when is too much or not enough. Um, but I tend to push back when I hear it's too hard. Uh, an example recently was uh, as part of that license compliance or license scanning work is we had to support 
offline environments. And what that meant was that in some scenarios, uh, people would install or run their own package registries internally, which would be uh, served by a TLS endpoint, a self-signed certificate. So if you think about it, like if I'm running a test for something that's going to go install packages and maybe source those packages from a TLS endpoint, like this is an end-to-end in, um, integration test at this point, the easy answer is say it's too hard. <laughs> but I took that as a challenge, like I don't believe you. How, how, do, how do we make this testable? And it turned out that that testability or even thinking about making a program more testable, uh, it, it was accomplished by using a proxy or an HA proxy or a setup in between and Toxy proxy. But there was ways to actually increase my level of um, skill by just thinking about how can I make this testable, right? And looking at the problem in a different way. And so it's hard for me to quantify the value of taking the time to think about how to make it testable because I think that those types of thoughts or problems when I look at it like that has actually improved me as an engineer and made me more valuable to the teams and organizations that I'm with rather than just solving the you know, specific problem. Um, you know, that might work for that moment of time, but as we know, programs change and other people come in. And so you're not writing tests for yourself, you're writing them for uh, the next person. It's a form of executable documentation. Uh, if you don't like write, believe in code comments or writing docs, the tests themselves uh, document the behavior of the code. And it's a safety net <laughs> if you care about your colleagues and the people after you. I just, I just wanted to add, um, I'm sorry, again, it's a little, not, not an off topic, but uh, a little bit of the idea because the question for uh, writing tests, it is so old, right? So I think everybody speaks about it. Even like, uh, I think that's the problem, not the problem, but the hot topic for all languages. Like for web development, that's the, you, you can go to the, any conference uh, without knowing this super duper language, you raise, raise your hand and say, how do you do, how do you deal with tests? Like you, you can ask this, like the, the common question, but Another interesting question, is there any tests in the future? Like as programming languages are evolving, we're getting more and more complexity inside of the code, more building blocks like specific libraries or black boxes that we, you know, put it on together. I've heard the thought that after some time, as the, uh, as the complexity of software is growing, monitoring will take over the tests. So monitoring behavior will take over the like initial phase of the testing because at some stage it's going to be so often and not that easy to break the system on the very low level. But you're going to figure out how it's how to behave on the uh, on the high level. And here comes the question: how to test tests? How to test the tests coverage? Right. So how do you put verification that there is no logic bugs in your test coverage even though it's all great and function i think that highlights a point of like a feedback loop right one of the benefits of writing tests is that you you know you're designing but you're also getting instantaneous feedback as to whether your assumption is making sense and so your point to monitoring or observability um, that's useful because it allows you to respond and to be able to respond, you need to be able to make your move, next move and adjust and be able to get that change out in a way that that response is timely. Like you can almost in the test uh, TDD loop where right green refactor. So observability and monitoring, I'm with you. I think uh, uh, we're, we're seeing more and more of it. We're going to see more and more of it because the assumptions that we make at code time versus the realities of runtime don't always align. And so the sooner you can uh, shorten that feedback loop of taking code time to run time and then being able to respond to that in a meaningful uh, loop uh, is going to outweigh the, any of the assumptions that we make. It's just the faster feedback loop. We're just moving it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It and also then, depends like, on... It actually changes the way you, how you deliver, right? So it changes yeah, the way how you think from, from the very beginning of starting implementation to the, to the point where it passes all the... Um, how to say that the way where you get the feedback loop because you can in your pipeline you can have a number of them right because you yes, like yes, yeah. you're treating this the cost of the bug on the early stages versus on the production so you you, you want to you know feedback faster and uh, often 
uh, before the uh, it gets to the production. Yeah. Can we describe it as like velocity and stability, and the feedback between the two? We're sort of moving it by pushing uh, the feedback cycles closer to production. Means you might be losing a little bit of stability for velocity, versus if you try to move the testing up front, you're focusing more on stability. Oh, go ahead, Austin. Yeah. But yeah, it's not not only about testing. Like feedback can uh, like uh, there are many uh things that can generate those feedbacks like starting from code review right so that's the very first initial feedback that you can get from your peer uh submitting your pull request and the first the feedback change single quote to double quote strike it back and you're gonna fix that right so and 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 getting i'm sorry further. tatiana <laughs> i shouldn't have brought that example up. i'm sorry All right, okay. we actually have a question for Sergey from Petro about actually uh, how can we define legacy we see revenant tests if we talk about and like could you brief, um, briefly answer uh, on this question and then we actually have a question for the audience. Sure, that's the very, you know, uh, I can answer that pretty easily. Legacy code doesn't have tests, revenant code has it. That's as is right but the devils are in details uh in terms of code survival it should pass a number of stages for uh, uh refactoring and uh you cannot refactor your code uh without having idea how you're going to test it so in the way to transform your code to the more uh, survival mode, you need to have your code logic is tightly connected to the test coverage, which means that it doesn't matter how hard or how big your test coverage, the test coverage for this kind of a code needs to add into the value of this particular code. So it should test not only correctness of implementation, but it should test the reason for this implementation to, to exist. Yeah, so I guess it's answered the question. So like, let's, let's ask the question for the audience. Uh -huh. uh, Sereja, thank you for asking, uh, for, for touching the theme of uh, test coverage. It's, it's basically what I wanted to talk about. You know, when your project gets, gets matured, when they have a lots of business logic, when they have uh, like when their their code base growing, code base of tests growing as well. So at a certain moment of time, uh, it uh, it turned out that uh, the time we can spend on uh, running all the tests uh, surpass some critical uh, critical critical value and. Uh, then uh, the hard decisions are to come. What what to do with it? How how to deal with it? Um, if this problem seems relevant, can you share your experience from audience? How do you manage it? Um, so the the question for for testing coverage, it's to uh, to have it in place and. Uh, I don't know how many of you seen tests that test nothing, just because we need to keep up with the, uh, uh, you know, cops to make the test coverage pass, to make the stupid, you know, faucets to be complete and so on and so forth. And uh, when you have, uh, you know, spaghetti code uh, and you have spaghetti tests, it's twice worse than if you just have spaghetti code, right? So throwing away tests and reconsidering those tests to be in place and to, to bring value to the team, that's the must. Uh, everybody blindly think that if they know how to do unit tests, now there is no cucumber, right? So unit tests can do like everything that you need. They think they are safe, right? Like we write tests, everything is gonna be fine. But um, to maintain with the tests and taking this responsibility to the, the, the engineer side, um, that's the, uh, not the, the binary decision, right? 
you as your um, code growth and complexity growth, you need to really think about ownership of the tests, the same way how do you treat ownership of the code, uh, which means that if you have like DevOps team who runs all the pipeline, if you have engineering team who follows the practices and, and know how to deliver faster, you should have testing team who speaks the same language as engineers at the same time they speak the, uh, who do they speak, like business owners, whoever. So answering your questions in short, uh, I prefer to having testing team than just over like over complicating the process of engineering uh, on the later stages for uh, for developers. Great. So, like, uh, maybe someone from the audience also want to answer this question and share the experience on the project. I see that Alex already raised his hand. Do you want to? Uh, something happening. So let's let's uh, and Alex. Uh, could you you raise a hand like first so you have like one minute for the answer okay uh, so i will be shortly uh, so uh, in my experience um, a lot of uh, startup projects that do not have the tests and uh, the customers of these projects uh, do not uh, accomplish to write in tests because it's uh, spent some extra costs or for development Etc. Uh, but uh, with my experience, I, I want um, that say that tests uh, is very uh, useful thing, and it have to be on the project. Uh, for example, it's uh, when you install CI/CD, it requires any tests. So uh, also tests is useful uh, when you. Uh, trying to refactor some hard complex system and break down warp one part and do not see what happened with uh, other parts of the system. And test is a smoke uh, green, uh, it's, a, it's a good thing that uh, just say you that you have the problem not in this part, but uh, a lot of parts of the system is broken by your refactoring or adding some features. Uh, yeah, but like, do you have some story about actually your experience with like bloating test and something like that? Or like, we yeah. can just pass the mic to the next speaker? Uh, yeah, I have uh, one interesting story. Uh, on one of my projects, I got uh, wor work it with TDD, uh, just try it. Uh, and uh, an awesome thing about TDD is that I developed its uh, feature and write and uh, write tests and developing feature and tests uh, show me that uh, features that I develop is uh, just uh, rotated by 100 degrees. So I, I just uh, develop it incorrect feature and test show it me on development stage when uh, the feature is not finished and goes into production or testing. Also, the second thing about test that uh, in, on your project is very good when you have not only auto tests, then you have a manual QA engineers. Uh, because uh, I, I got uh, projects, then I, I have manual QA, and that guys found such bugs that I can never imagine that user could click and could uh, uh, way uh, in use my my feature in such way so it's very useful guys cool great yeah. thanks for for the input so let's pass the mic to i guess probably want to add something yeah yeah so i have uh, quite strong very strong opinion about tests so couldn't pass on this one uh, so about tests in general i usually uh, when i uh, give advice to some uh, novice develop junior developers or some even some computer science students. Uh, I usually give this advice so when they are inter being interviewed for some company and ask them about their test policy. Uh, and if they answer something like uh, developers don't write tests, so or we have QA for that, or 
only some core features are covered, then I advise them to just run like hell <laughs> and don't look back. And usually, so that's uh, really, well, it really works. It, it, it all, well, uh, the general culture uh, of well, overall code, code quality, uh, dedication to code quality is, is depending, is depending on uh, uh, whether like uh, test, uh, how, how the testing is being done. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, well, with time, with time, uh, I've uh, evolved about uh, the whole test testing approach. Uh, so now I don't uh, like strictly follow TDD in absolutely all of the cases because I think that uh, with time I discovered that probably there are some le legitimate cases where uh, you you will be better off without TDD, like throwing off some quick and dirty MVP, for example. So that's uh, but there are some lots of uh, actual cases where. Uh, making uh, functionality via TDD is even faster. So it's the fastest way of doing uh, things, of developing things. And as a side effect, you also got the, the test coverage. So that's, well, and uh, I discover more and more uh, of such uh, cases where it's, it's not only the best, but also, well, <laughs> but also the fastest. So that's how well, I mean, also, well, surely it's it's always about the balance. So you shouldn't test too much because it, it will run too. <laughs> uh, the test suite will be too long. And like if, if it's too long, so developers have less intensive to even wait what is happening on uh, some uh, continuous integration server, long queue, et cetera, et cetera. Also seen some really bloated uh, test cases. So it's usually the balance, especially the integration tests, they have to be balanced. But if, if this balance is right, this gives, well, this basically gives the ultimate confidence. And confidence gives peace of mind. And peace of mind is actually like the biggest contribution for developer uh, quality of life uh, in the end. So, I think that tests is actually, and the good testing practices is what made uh, that in ultimately increase uh, developers' quality of life by a big, by a huge margin. So being yeah, I just wanted to add to, to what you're saying specifically, like if you're thinking about tests, you need to think about the bugs, right? So if you need to, write tests, how much time you spend and effort to money, in this case, to complete everything from a testing point of view versus cost of the bug. So if, you, if the bug costs you way less or fewer than effort that you, like if there is a couple of users who use your application and from time to time it fails, not a big deal. And uh, making it work like months to to have like perfect test coverage and all the aspects and, and make it super duper resilient no point at all right so the balance with what you were saying i think the balance for for testing and the quality should engage uh business and the the reason is it worth it or not well yes yeah, the, the balance is usually uh, i tried i think about it as uh well every application has the main main money making flow if, if this application makes money. So that's the first obvious thing that should be 100% should have hundred percent test coverage. And then all the other you expand, then you uh, expand from there. Yeah, and, and just for the bugs, usually, by the way, like it's the, the, the decision whether you need to fix that bug. If you need to fix that bug, then you are better, probably you would be better off, especially it's hard to reproduce that bug. You would be better off to write test to reproduce it first, then fix it. So that's one, one of the many cases where uh, that would be faster to do via TDD because really. Uh, From my experience, I had one project where the, the bug was identified, but to fix this bug would take way more time than just to put 
you know, notification saying, hey, it looks like <laughs> this part of software is not working properly right now. And you experienced this bug, so we're sorry. <laughs> Could you get back, like roll back to the previous stage and not try to <laughs> use this button again? So use a different one. <laughs> not, not literally the button, but the way uh, the, the report generated has some bug in the core logic. Like to fix it was hard and would affect potentially more users than just isolate this one corner case saying, yeah, yeah, we know, we know, it's a bug. And we will notify you when it happens. Well, this is life. <laughs> that's that's the true story. Yeah, and like uh, I actually have a few topics that we like. We are running out of time, but I have a few topics that uh, I would love to discuss with you. But like I would like uh, on a on the right of the host, I actually want to add the last piece to this topic. So uh, in GitLab, our this jobs, I guess it's run for four hours, maybe two. I know, like it's too long. It's like it's longer than my lunch, so it's it's too long. And right now we actually have like a cool initiative to improve the speed of the test. Nothing like we don't delete any tests because we need them, but people try to optimize them to change. Uh, the first step was actually change, uh, create like remove creation of the database objects as much as we as we can. So it's really improve uh, the speed of the test, like without, uh, like and we don't have like to throw away anything. So something like that. And right now let's discuss another topic. Let's discuss. So we are now on the. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what is the state of the things in uh, your place, people, but um, here we actually kind of uh, in a soft lockdown, let's say. So let's discuss uh, how the work change with uh, this new normal COVID-19 stuff and how it's changed. Like, so we are right now on a, I don't know, six or eight months of the pandemia, I'm not sure, but like how it changed over time for you. So, does anyone want to start? Maybe Anne? Maybe Anna? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Uh, basically, I feel, don't throw anything into me. <laughs> I feel a little bit relieved um, after this uh, lockdown or soft lockdown had happened because part of my team uh, is here in Luxembourg and uh, another part, like main part of my team is in Moscow. And uh, as we were a company who works in the office, uh, like 100% of the time, it was, uh, we experienced uh, communication issues. But after lockdown happened, we turned uh, more into online or partially online communication and there was no such thing as uh, we discussed it like aloud so every discussion right now goes via zoom via via chat uh, and uh, basically in the company i am standing for uh, publicity for public discussions public chats uh, like uh, not uh, direct messaging because when Oh, okay, I, I, I can speak on this subject a lot. Yeah. Um, but speaking personally right now, I'm so happy that our office uh, is opened and I'm allowed to go there. And uh, well, of course, as many of us, we took a lot of measures to, like, to, to make workplace safe, uh, to increase the space, which is actually as well good and beneficial for me and yeah so it thanks to this lockdown my uh quality of life and workplace improved <laughs> what about you guys well maybe you can share something about gitlab because gitlab is a remote company and we were working way before like remotely way before the start of the pandemic but i'm sure it's changed the like the the game for everyone yeah i think uh, initially there wasn't like a 
really direct impact to the day to day, like at work wise. The impact was more like on the personal side with the, the kids being home and, uh, you know, not being able to go out in, in public. And so um, I really enjoy working from home. It creates the time and space necessary for me to do my best work. And then all of a sudden I'm surrounded by family all, all day, every day. And they're very dynamic and they have uh, things going on. And so that, uh, you know, uh, added a little bit of stress in terms of like uh, initially figuring out a school curriculum, uh, going from physical classroom to getting them into the online classroom. And there was some stress about even just sharing laptops so that they can get on the classroom, et cetera. And so I'm sorting some of those out and getting a schedule in place for, for, for the kids uh, so that they could understand. One where I get an email, I'm assigned an issue with check boxes that basically walk me through here's what we need to, to do from what you need to order so that you can have a proper working environment, making sure that you understand that you aren't required to respond uh, synchronously constantly. And so these sorts of things um, were very helpful. I can only imagine what it's like for organizations that had to switch from being in office to working fully remote and uh, some of the challenges that might be involved with that. Fortunately, uh, work didn't take a big hit for me. I think it was more just the people in, involved at work had different responsibilities and things to take care of at home. And so uh, we adjusted accordingly. So I, um, I found that I got much closer to my family <laughs> this year. I learned a lot more about them because they were here constantly. So I could utilize some of the flexibility of uh, working for GitLab to actually spend more time with them and uh, take an hour to play StarCraft II or go draw on the whiteboard, <laughs> you know, and that made me a happier employee. So I think it's actually, I understand it's been really tough for a lot of people. It's been actually um, a good year for me. Yeah, it's, it's great. Like if something good, good for someone at least, sure. I will so, say one more thing is like yeah. it did open up a lot more opportunity for me here in Calgary than any time before because uh, Calgary is known to be like a technical hub and with a lot of organizations now looking to hire remotely and working remotely it's like the options for where I can work just increased and so opportunity increased for myself as well as all people in my city which I think is fantastic. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really great. So Sergey, would uh, could you like yeah, to add um, something? Yeah, I would add to this topic um, idea of efficiency. So the com comfort in the like mental health, because you're not always feeling like being a you know social human being. We need to this personal touch to to go out to talk to meet with other people. I, I wanted to add the. Um, um, the point that Zoom became an evil because sitting home with the old habits with your team, you started doing Zoom calls all the day without any particular need. Like, hey, I have a question. Let's have a Zoom. Let's do it. Let's go in Zoom. We start calling. You can eat at this time. You can go walk with your dog at this time. So you're getting um, a prisoner of online communication with your fault. You cannot just say like, during my daytime, I'm not answering your call. Like I need to be focused on a particular task, like go on my calendar and see that there is like offline blocks that nobody can, you know, uh, nobody can, uh, can use because we, we started doing a lot of like trying to substitute the real communication switching from traditional office that was like day by day located in the city. Uh, we started to use instead Zoom. So we had Zoom drink cups at night, drinking wine and beer, talking, chatting, Zoom, playing Quake and Star uh, StarCraft and all the other games. Again, you're playing the game, you're talking in Zoom. Zoom retrospective every 
Friday, we call everybody in Zoom, sharing some, not, not related to work, just sharing some news, what's happening, Zoom parties, Zoom discussions, Zoom planning, like everything in Zoom, which is so annoying. And sometimes just what to feel that you are not reachable, like nobody can reach you out, they cannot distract you, you're just sitting quiet and do what you need to do. So I don't know, the, the question of efficiency, how to keep communication, keep it up, but at the same time, not, not to be the, the prisoner of, of the internet um, all 24 hours a day. Yeah, it's a really good uh, like a suggestion. Yes, I guess it's really important to have these blocks when nobody can disturb you. And we are running out of time, but I really want to uh, ask you the last question, if you agree. So uh, we are approaching this new milestone in the uh, life of Ruby language 3.0, and we already have a pre-release version for it. So would you like to share uh, what you expect from this milestone? And maybe uh, you have some thoughts how it can change the landscape of Ruby development. Sergey, want, do we want to start? Um, that's, that's a good point for, um, for upgrading. So everybody who were uh, sitting and waiting for something to start preparing your system for upgrade, that's a great milestone, okay. Like it could happen anytime, but that's like, I'm starting my new life from the next Monday or I'm starting new life from, from the 1st of January. I'm starting doing good things from Ruby 3.0 release. So now efficiently in my team, we're starting preparing for upgrade all the, you know, old fashioned applications. That's a good point in this case. I don't think like anything, again, uh, the one that I said, being uh, that many years in specifically like Ruby community, nothing could really uh, surprise you the same way as iPhone users uh, who were surprised by introducing magnets on the backside of the phone, which is of course great innovation and, and, uh, and point for marketing. I don't think anything that great introduced in Ruby can beat Elixir, for example, which is of course different, but at the same time. So I keep the idea of using the right tools for, uh, for the right tasks. And in this case, Ruby has its own niche, which is fast, clear, human-centric, team-friendly, and um, you know, fighting for performance or fighting for uh whatever availability in the new virtual system such as serverless approaches or something like that like to be more uh, adapted to new uh, cloud native environment uh, of course good but again if you build a new application or if you build a new project you have a, have a dozen different technologies from HTML, GS, different kinds of databases that you have uh, with different languages, with different services, different third parties and APIs. So I think in this case, I would take the Ruby upgrade more like good to know, but nothing dramatically would change for me driving like existing project. Yeah, probably, but uh, let's see how it's actually, how how this milestone, and like how it will be adapted. So maybe Mo, could you share your thoughts on this important milestone? I, I remember the talk that Mats did on uh, three by three. So Ruby three is to be three times faster than Ruby two. And we've seen a lot of uh, work already done in the Ruby 2 series. And so I think Ruby 3 is sort of more of um, the, uh, accept the acknowledgement that of all that work that's happened. There are a couple things that I'm interested in in, in Ruby 3. Uh, the R actor model, uh, I've been following Sam Williams and the work he's been doing with fibers and async HTTP and async IO. 
I've had a, I played a little bit with async HTTP and I'm just blown away at the HTTP2 client that's in there. Uh, so I'm excited to see where the R actor model goes and how they're able to uh, deal with concurrency and parallelism with, uh, you know, as or they mentioned, like a human centric focus. Um, and, and so people can stop picking on Ruby. Um, on top of that, I'm not sure how I feel about types and this type system. I didn't, I haven't been following the type to system discussion or where it's currently at. If there's going to be some way to just to um, uh, provide signatures for methods or interfaces. So I feel like the, the type system is something that I'm not excited about, but I, I don't know because I haven't had any much experience with things like sorbet, et cetera, uh, to, to understand the, the pros and the cons to it. Aside from that, I don't know a heck of a lot more about what's happening in Ruby 3. So I am I will probably install it on you know Christmas when it's released just to hack on something. But I don't know if, if it's going to significantly or fundamentally shift the way that I program. Um, so I, it's you know a great achievement for the, all the people involved in Ruby core who have been working on this for many years. And I guess the last thing is the MJIT. I don't know if JIT is becoming the default or if it's still a switch. Uh, but uh, I guess we'll find out more about that. That's that's my takeaway on Ruby three. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, also like um, I also remember that Mats promised us the Ruby three in the year of Olympics in Tokyo, but unfortunately, oh. and I, I, like I guess, yeah, like we get Ruby three even faster than uh, Olympics in Tokyo. So Anna, would you like to share your thoughts on the topic? Yeah, for sure. When I'm thinking about Ruby 3, uh, I'm thinking about how great refactoring is waiting for me and for my big projects. And you know what? I'm basically not expecting, like from the very beginning, from after switching uh, the speed up of my applications, I, I, I really expect hard coding, hard working uh, on refactoring before I can reach some improvements in speed and performance. So this is my uh, expectations, of course, for good. Of course, we were waiting for it for so long time, but still <laughs> maybe I'm like too, too into the uh, current, current projects than uh, like, more practical, less uh, ideological speaking, but yeah. Uh, anyway, it will touch all of us in uh, less or more minutes. Still, there is some room for surprise, right? So you you never know. You never know when you wake up in the uh, after the Christmas night. You open the box with Ruby three, and and your discovery that takes now four hours magically starting taking like two hours because of you know concurrency run or something that is done better who knows but it's definitely very good even though we are all uh, pessimistic about like okay ruby 3 ruby 3 but that's a very good point like well done even though like the the corona and all this you know stuff that happened uh you know community keep it up and uh, the release is going to be happening which is awesome yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So I guess it's the end of our panel discussion. So I would like to uh, say thank you for all our guests, for Anna, Moore, Sergey, because it was, I don't know, for like from other uh, audience, but for me, it was really interesting to hear all your opinions. So thank you very much for being uh, with us today.